Welcome back to Miyazaki and Me. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle. And I am your other host, Shane. Uh, this episode, we are going over our first film, uh, which the first film we are reviewing is The Castle of Cagliostro. Um, it's available on Netflix to watch, so if you want to watch along with us, uh, pause it right now, go watch the movie, uh, enjoy it, and then come back and watch the rest and listen to the rest of the podcast. So this film was released in 1979. And Shane, who was all was involved? Yeah, so uh, this was directed by the namesake of our podcast here, uh, Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, it was produced by uh, Tetsuo Kadayama. Um, and screenplay was written, written by Miyazaki and Har- uh, Haruya uh, Yamazaki. Uh, it's based off of uh, the Lupin the Third um, uh, manga series uh, by uh, Monkey Punch. Um, very, very famous uh, manga in Japan. Uh, there are a few different Loop in the Third series, uh, including a lot of episodes actually directed by Miyazaki himself. Kind of uh, catapulted him into where he is, uh, which is why we're starting with this movie. Yeah, um, yeah, because there there have been, uh, at least as, as of my knowledge, I believe it says it's there have been three part series. Um, Loop in the third part one, uh, which even on Wikipedia, it says basically it was half and half, uh, actually, uh, Miyazaki directing episodes and then, uh, Takata directing episodes. Um, and then our, the loop in the third part two, which was actually, uh, airing at around this same time, uh, Miyazaki would end up directing the finales of so uh, and it's it's still pretty much going on today I mean the last series of Lupin the Third was actually 2018 uh, and that was Lupin the Third part five which is actually the sixth series uh, because they did a uh, Fujiko uh, series in there as well which Lupin the Third the woman called Fujiko uh, Mine so that that's also in there so Lupin the Third third part five is the sixth uh, portion of it but there's a lot of actual loop in the third films as well yep yeah like you said it's one of those series it's based off a a, a french series that was adapted to the to a manga um and yeah it's, it's been really interesting uh so it's all about a a gentleman thief who actually most of the the criticism i actually heard heard and saw online about this was the fact that Miyazaki made uh, Lupin, or as he's referred to pretty often in in this, uh, instead as as Wolf because of some rights issues, apparently. Um, he uh, he made him too charming and too too nice, almost like he was too chivalrous in this uh, particular uh, than the characters normally portrayed. It's a little different. He's he's more of a of a sneaky cat kind of kind of guy. I mean, it, the all all Lupin stuff are pretty much heist uh, capers uh, over and over again. But it's the this film kind of needed him to be a little more charming uh, to set it up. But you know, it is what it is. I actually realized while watching this that I had seen this film uh, when I was younger that um because i i actually did watch loop in the third uh, at a younger age here because it was on toonami for a while when i was in middle school oh so cool. there was a lot of loop in the third that i watched uh, and this was one of the movies that i did did get to see through that uh, i didn't remember a lot of it i just remembered uh, there was a couple little points that i re- recognized and i was like oh yeah no i, I do recognize this kind of kind of situation so it wasn't one of those things where like it stuck with me okay like, uh, there, there's some recognizable scenes. Cool. Um, so before we get into it, uh, just for a general context, uh, we're going to always do a segment called uh, Animation Timeline, uh, talking about other movies and TV shows that were animated around the same time that were released. Um, and we had some interesting ones, like you had uh, the Jack Frost stop motion Christmas special was around the same time. 
and uh, Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner, and the Flintstones meet Rockula and and Frankenstone. Uh, as far as films you know, that were released. <laughs> Uh, uh, but then on the, on the, on the television side, uh, it's a little more interesting because you had one of the first seasons of, uh, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. Uh, you also had, uh, the first season of Ultraman. And, uh, this was the same year that was the start of the incredibly long-running multi multi-franchise series that is mobile mobile suit gundam i was gonna bring that up if you if, uh because i wasn't sure if you pulled that one but yeah no i i remember that mul- uh, mobile suit gundam did come out in in 79 as well uh that is a series that i have watched through a great deal of them uh myself and a good buddy of mine craig uh we get together sometimes and, and watch these and it's the animation style between mobile suit Gundam and uh, this show, uh, this movie, uh, this loop in the third are very similar. Yeah. Uh, you can see that that is kind of the, the norm in uh, Japanese animation at the time. Yep. Uh, and then, and then an interesting uh, trivia note. Uh, this is the only Miyazaki feature film uh, that is not scored by uh, Joe, his, his, uh, Ashi. Uh, yeah, this one was scored by the person uh, that pretty much did all of the uh, of the Lupin stuff. If you if you look at his his music list, it's it's really he's got Lupin through the years up into the two thousands. Uh, he's got Lupin the third albums that came out. Um, so yeah, let's get into a general overview of the plot. Um, we won't go beat by beat by any means, but just a general overview and then we'll we'll take our our highlights and and things that we took out of it. Um, so the movie starts out right away post heist, uh, which I loved. Yeah, I really I really enjoyed that they jumped right into the action. I, I put that in here and I thought that a couple of the the fleeing bits were kind of funny. I, I wrote down that the, they, they had cut a car in half, uh, yep. which was kind of a, a bit of a funny little bit. Yeah, it was it was very like kind of some of the stuff that gets too overused, uh, at least in my uh, perspective, in modern anime is the silly gags that it's like, OK, that can't happen every single time that you flee a scene like we've got to have a little bit of realism. And I realize I'm saying this about a heist movie, um, but, you know, like, but once in a while having just the little bits of of you know the car just breaking down as they they drive away was really fun um so it was like oh wow you, like we're you're right into it it you know they're they're robbing this casino they successfully do it they're on the getaway they get away successfully and then you realize that the money is counterfeited. Uh, yeah, and then they decide to just throw the money out uh, onto the street, which I'm sure uh, they didn't go delve into, but probably caused a little bit of a traffic jam. And they jumped into a montage and opening song that the music felt a little out of the elements for what this is. But I actually, I really liked what they did with it. Uh, they, yeah. They, they kind of scored a, uh, Lupin, you know, said that he, he kind of knows where this, this might have come from. And, and they, they do this montage uh, and song where they're they're traveling essentially, and a couple little uh, little nice images uh, on that on that road, uh, and it and it worked for me actually. Yeah, it it was a nice like '60s like like spy caper kind of a musical in, in interlude. You know, it was it was really cool. So so then we're introduced to Princess Claire Reese. As she is running away from like these spies, is or guards or something, and Lupin's like, "Oh, we've got to help her." And uh, uh, Gidgen, who's uh, Lupin's kind of second in his like kind of heavy his bodyguard almost, um, he's like, "Which one should we help?" Uh, he's like, "Oh, we got to help the girl for sure." Which was a nice little character touch of like, oh, no, we got to help this girl for sure. 
and this led to a really cool chase scene. Uh, I actually, I very much enjoyed it. It really showed off the the quality for physical animation that animes had at this time. Yep. Something something that I, I feel Japanese animation around this point with with the other things coming out did a little bit better than what American animation did because I think American animation at uh, at this this kind of snippet in time might have looked a little bit cleaner in the general motion but once things really started moving that's when japanese animation really kind of took off and looked a little bit a little nicer a little smoother uh uh-huh. yeah that's that's why like i brought up and i know it's a it's a television show as opposed to uh, a feature film so there's probably a little more quality on the on the feature but that's why i brought up the the scooby-doo that was going on because it's like you get those chase scenes and scooby-doo and they're all kind of a little herky-jerky and a little you know uh more more theatrical for sure um and don't look as smooth so yeah very much so this one this one i mean right from the get-go from this scene and you you get a really notice that they're not they're not cutting corners on some of this on some of the big action stuff that's going on there's you know some of the as they're talking and animation and things like that is not as crisp as you would expect from watching the action sequences yep um but yeah he rescues the girl they fall off a cliff which was great uh because apparently he uses his go-go gadget grappling hook yeah uh yeah that was in the in the trivia section there was uh apparently steven spielberg was uh, thinking about possibly doing a Lupin movie at one point it said um, and so they they credit it's like oh Lupin's why Data's got the 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 gadgets and that kind of stuff I was like no it's not completely Lupin it's Data's definitely ripping off James Bond but um, well it to is... kind of to kind of build off that a bit uh, this this was something I was gonna bring up later but the this movie it itself has been cited as a possible influence for the indiana jones films by spielberg and, and lucas okay that makes sense it makes sense because you've got you've got that tone for sure yep and and the the treasure hunting and and the the lupin is very similar to, lupin and this is very similar to indiana jones yep and, and the 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 actual the help of the sidekicks and everything like it, it all kind of kind of adds adds up uh they they said particularly the first film raiders of the lost ark the you know the beginning yeah uh, this was sense. just two years before that came out so while they were in production for it they would have seen if they enjoy japanese animation they would have seen this movie yeah and and spielberg always comes off as a guy who very much especially at this point in time was watching everything um so very much so uh, but yeah, they 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 go to Caglia Ke- Ke- Eostro, you know, rescue the princess. She's got this ring um, that she she's got uh, that that uh, Lupin or like as I keep saying, he he's referred to as Wolf mostly in the English dub. Um, so that's what I have all my my notes written down as, and. You know he he's got this ring and you keep uh, I keep saying that like it very much felt like uh, like Star Trek two uh, Wrath of Khan scenario of like I feel like this is touching on something previous uh, and I didn't know if it was going to be a previous episode or a flashback um, but it's like uh, it's it's working on on. Uh, a vague thing from the past of this character and then at least we get to see uh later on there is actually flashbacks x to what he's talking about but i wasn't sure if it was like oh khan you know in the wrath of khan situation it was you know khan did appear in an episode of star trek before wrath of khan and that's what they're alluding to of they have this past but you don't need to know the specifics to get, you know, where the story is going. So. Oh yeah, and and very much so. And and one thing that I enjoy about this movie is that they, uh, and and about Lupin in general, they don't discount some of the side characters and their knowledge. Uh, like Jigen, uh, who is with Lupin the whole time here, he's the one doing the heist at the beginning with him. He 
immediately goes, you you already know about this place. You know something about this. And, and Lupin's like, I'm not going to talk about it now. And so, yeah. you know, they, they they plant the seeds that, that no one – no one in the – no one at the top in these movies are really out of the know. Like they're all smart characters, which I actually enjoy about about this movie in particular. I actually wrote down that I, I enjoy that, you know, in a little bit here they'll introduce the inspector. And, you know, he's not the, the dopey inspector that that is, you know, a step behind Lupin because he's, cause he's being outwitted completely. He's somebody that is being outwitted by Lupin, but after figuring things out – uh, himself because he's a smart character yeah and, 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 and that's the kind of growth and and character characters that i enjoy from the lupin series yeah and and that was that was one of going to be the next uh one of the next characters i talk about uh because as uh but before we get to him we got to and it's just a little scene at first but i could already tell uh when when uh Lupin and and Gijin get to the abandoned castle and they find the groundskeeper and I'm just like oh Shane loves this guy already the was really Jigen gr- or the groundskeeper the groundskeeper oh yeah he was great he was just he was just like ah screw you guy he's he's that wise old man that you knew was gonna help him out uh in the end yeah yeah it's like he's gonna help him out eventually but he's going to be very gruff and and unassure unsure about it and i love the touch later on that the reason that he helps them is uh because his dog oh, likes 100%. them it's like yeah, dog's good and it's like yep good, good uh judge a character so the dog likes you i like you that's how this goes yep exactly well, they, they all uh, introduce but then the count uh, uh counts uh uh cagliostro and I really enjoyed the introduction of the Count because right away he comes off – well, he comes off kind of snooty uh, and a little sleazy. But him – in the very – in the scene that you get introduced to him, he walks in and stares at the unconscious um, uh, Clarice and grabs her hand. And it just comes off as just uh, – like I wrote down yuck. I was like this – I don't yep. like where what this what's happening right here, and then they, sh- and they show that he only you know cares about the ring and everything because he like throws the hand down when the ring's gone, and you see that it's not a, uh, it's not fully a obsession of this. It's 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 more of a humperdink from Princess Bride obsession of, of you know the need of the idea of marrying her rather than wanting to marry her. So it's not an obsession with the woman, but it's an obsession with what she can give him. And they show that really yeah, well yeah. while still showing off how creepy and sleazy he is in just a small scene too. Yeah. Like he, he yeah, he's so creepy in that scene, you know, for, even from the character design, like big broad shoulders, you know, that's interesting haircut and he's got an ascot and literally the only person who doesn't look terrible in an ascot is Fred from Scooby-Doo. I love uh, Fred ascot. Everyone looks terrible in an ascot. Um, and the butler, or like his assistant, is the creepiest character in this movie um, from his body language. Well, the butler's also the leader of the ninjas, which the ninjas yep. very much are something that it's that style of creepiness that Miyazaki ends up bringing to films for years uh it's yes i i i i love uh actually how i wrote down about the ninjas was they feel like they're a cross between the foot clan and lady Deathstrike. oh yeah i put down that they that the way that they move and that they use them was very otherworldly which is which is a sense that miyazaki loves to kind of slip into a lot of his movies and obviously a lot of his movies are otherworldly in a sense in, in many ways but he really likes that otherworldly and that disconnected from the norm kind of feel for some of these, some of these characters, which, which I think he portrayed in this movie in particular portrayed in the ninjas the most uh, and kind of get, yes. gives away uh, to me. It was just a taste of future of future Miyazaki kind of style and where he goes. So I really liked the ninja. Yeah. Like you, yeah. Like you said, they, they, 
they have an otherworldly thing and you you almost feel like they're not human until uh it's uh it's goman and with with a samurai sword cuts the armor off and you realize like oh they they're human under this okay they are they are human they're not you know this weird like mutant hybrid or something and that you almost thought they would be uh going in it's like oh they're they're just human okay and then uh after the the ninja scene it, it jumps right into a a f- couple scenes back to back to back that's really a bringing the gang all together where they're bringing in all the the characters that people know from lupin uh you see one character uh, who is the the assistant to the count kind of sneaking off into a back room and, and looking through a, a picture. And I mean, people that have watched Lupin before uh, would wouldn't recognize her as a uh, uh, Fujiko. And so they would recognize her as Fujiko uh, in disguise because she's just a, a blonde character and in a Lupin thing, you're probably like, ah, it's probably Fujiko. Uh, and then Goemon uh, shows up. Uh, he just kind of comes in on a, on a cart and and you know calmly walks in and sits down and he's just like all right just tell me when you need me and hangs back for a long time yeah like i i i was wondering the whole time as he was introduced like okay they introduced this guy when are they going to use him uh he's not he's not really doing anything yet oh but he's one of those guys that uh, going on is is when when I started watching this movie, my first question was, "Where is the samurai?" So where's Goemon? Uh, and and so I was just waiting for him to come in because he's he's somebody that that exudes a uh, presence. And if you have too much of him, that you are sitting there and waiting for what what is he going to do? Um, or if you have too much of him, it kind of overpowers the movie. So I think that they did really well on this one of having him sit back and and waiting until the big fight kind of pops up. Yeah, that was like like this movie without a doubt the main character is Lupin. Yes. Um but you you get such interesting side characters like 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 Gijin, like a like Fujika, uh, you know, like a like Goemon, you know. Even as and we haven't talked to him about him yet, like even Inspector Zen, Zengata, like Inspector Zenigata could have his own movie, you know. Yep, Zen- Zenigata coming in next was was really good because that was actually right after Goemon comes. They see Zenigata coming in and meeting the the count, Count Cagliostro, and he, right away he's just like, "I don't trust that dude. Something's up. What's going on here?" And it kind of plants the seeds for uh, which what is a very rare team up between. In Inspector Zenigata and Lupin later on in the film. Yeah, which which was really interesting, and I like the sizing up up that happens between Zenigata and and the Count uh, because they both know it's like okay, like Zenigata's like okay, I this guy I'm technically here to protect him, but he's doing something wrong, and the Count sees Zen, Zenigata and is just like. Uh, if I want to get away with any of the stuff that I'm trying, I have to get rid of this guy, no matter what. Yep. You know, I have to get him out of my way. Um, and then Lupin, uh, Lupin trapped, uh, sneaks in through the aqueducts, which was super I cool. Laughed too much. I laughed at that scene too much, by the way. Oh, really? It was one of those things I was like, they did not earn the laughter that, that came out of my mouth during this scene. When he's trying to swim up the uh, the little waterfall thing, I'm just, yes. I kept laughing. And I was like, I there's no reason for me to be laughing here. Yeah, well, and then I love the, like, oh. Like, even, even Zenigata, like, proving how smart he is, is just the, you know, all right, how, how many ways can you get into this building? Well, you can do, you know, this, this, this. And it's like, where's that river? Where's that, that fountain flow out of? Oh, it, it, you know, it flows all the way from the aqueducts up and through this, this uh, thing. Why do we not have a guard posted right there? He's going to try and get in right there. And it's like, he did. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it's one of those things that just kind of proves that he's not that bumbling stereotype of, of cop in this. 
he's he's very observant because the reason why he thinks about that is that he sees just a small twitch in the in the cogs of that and he goes oh that's not right yeah and put it all together right away yeah uh, yeah he he very he very much seems like uh, a more a modern comparison in a in a heist movie. Uh, it's not a one to one comparison by any means, but uh, he I got a similar vibe and a similar uh, uh, dichotomy and 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 stuff between Lupin and Zen, Zenigata as uh, all of the Ocean Team and Andy Garcia's character. Like Andy Garcia's character in those ocean movies always kind of knew what they were up to and was trying to get a step ahead of them, but they just barely outsmarted him. Yep, because, and, and it's the same kind of thing with Lupin, where where Lupin expects Zenigata to figure these things out because he knows that he's a smart man. So he's just staying the step ahead by the, by the fact that he's preparing to be caught. Yep, exactly. And that's why he's Interpol's number one most wanted, apparently. So, and then uh, uh, next it leads into uh, a Fujiko and and Lupin uh, reuniting, where Fujiko lets Lupin know where uh, Clarice is being uh, kept, and a little interesting uh, scene of Lupin figuring out how to get over to the the tower that he needs to, uh, and that completely messing up on him because his lighter doesn't work. <laughs> oh completely yeah uh that was like it wasn't like i was on i was actually on the edge of my seat for that scene because i was just like i i've got a thing with heights anyway um and so the fact that he's running up and you know all this crazy stuff of uh, on the top of these towers and you just see the sheer fall off of like, oh no, what's good? like? What could possibly happen here? So, uh, and then and then he gets over and and he has his uh, reunion uh, with Clarice. They have a small discussion. He gives her a ring. Yep. Uh, they are caught, and they drop Lupin down a shaft. Um, oh, I guess we skipped something. Uh, they also drop the inspector down a shaft earlier. That's kind of important. Yeah, they, they dropped the inspector down a shaft earlier because uh, there are trap doors galore in this. And I I liked it because it was it was one of those not realistic things that I super enjoyed because it's kind of cartoony. And it's like, of course, there's a trap door. And of course, you, you know, arm it by turning the statue's head, you yep. know. Why not? Uh, and then uh, this leads into a scene where, I mean, like the ninjas surrounded him and it's it's the Count and Clarice together. And another scene where it was just that sleaziness of the Count that just made me so uncomfortable. Because it's a, it's a sweet little reunion scene. And this is, you know, some of the, some of the point of like where Lupin isn't exactly the Lupin of the, of the show. But he's, he's having a sweet little scene with, uh, with Clarice. And, they drop him down the, the bin and then there's this just creepiness of the count who she starts to cry and he calls her a seductress after she starts crying. And I just, once again, I cringed. Yeah. I was so creeped out by that scene. Cause it was like, wait, uh, no, how's that? How do you think that's seducing you? Like she's completely vulnerable. And why, why are you like this? Uh, and then, and then you get a, a you know some classic tropes of of uh, villains thinking that that you know oh that had to kill killed him, like, he's dead it's fine, uh, and then they're just like we just got to go get the ring off of him but everything's fine and it's just like one of those things where I was confused because I went you dropped him down the hole, and then he talked to you through a through a communicator, and you put some water down the hole after him and then you went yep that killed him the water did it, <laughs> yeah it's like okay sure um uh but now you get the team up now you get the uh team up between lupin and uh inspector so which is which is cool which is when uh it, it you don't you don't really expect if if you watched any lupin you don't really expect uh zenigata and lupin to ever kind of pair up they're they're always the the cat and mouse they're the you know pink panther and 
uh, Inspector Lassard. No, I don't even remember the name. Inspector Cousseau, I think. Yeah, yep. Uh, so it's 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 kind of it's kind of a fun dynamic. They find the counterfeit dungeon because <laughs> it's it's downstairs. Yeah, it's it's an entire yeah, it's like the entire basement of this ca- of this castle. Um, and then this is when uh, the ninjas just nearly murder lupin correct uh no that's that's uh that's yeah th- during their escape from this because first they set was first they set the money on fire <laughs> yes which i think is like i had like sh- it was shades of joker <laughs> like it was it was just one of those things where you're just like yeah. like they're like oh all this cash it's the best counterfeit i've ever seen let's just burn it <laughs> Yeah. Well, and and then the but the 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 smart thing about like burning it was uh we keep cutting back to to Goemon and 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 guy and Gijin uh talking about it's like, "Yep, we're going to get over there whenever we need to. Uh we just got to wait for the signal. We just got to wait for the signal." And then the entire castle is on on, on fire and there's all this smoke and they're just like, "Yep, that's the <laughs> signal." Uh, and you know, they, they, uh, they steal this gyrocopter and go up to save the princess. And as they're doing this, Lupin gets shot, which yep. surprised me. And there was blood and it was just one of those things that I was just like, I very much was not expecting this at all. Like, this is not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I was, I was expecting, like, as soon as the gyrocopter like shows up, I was like, Okay, this is perfect, like, 60s spy heist movie, but also in all of the things that I know about Miyazaki. It's like, no, Miyazaki's the one who, <laughs> who's like, oh, no, we're going to do this, like, gyrocopter scene because um, I want to do something with an aerial vehicle. Yeah. And it's like, of course you did. Essentially, they, uh, you know, there's this, there's this nice nice scene I, I really enjoyed it of the standoff of Lupin after Lupin was shot and Clarice is covering his body and and only agreeing to help if they let him go um, and obviously the villain isn't going to actually do it but uh, the uh, inspector uh, um, uh, Zenigata who cannot control the gyrocopter that he's now flying comes by at the exact moment and and fujiko and and lupin are able to escape and fujiko being uh the badass woman that she is is just like all right i'm gonna go and like just paraglides away from them um because fujiko is a badass woman yeah i i did yeah we we yeah we 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 skipped over it a little bit but i like fujiko's reveal to clarice that she's not her like handmaiden or like the count's assistant of just like taking down the hair out of the bun, taking off the glasses, having this military outfit, and then starting to construct this yep. hang glider just in front of her. A very much nice little setup to be like, what is she doing? And then when she actually uses it, you're like, oh, yeah, that's what she was doing. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, oh, of course she has a hang glider. As they're it's, as they're yeah. escaping, there's a there's a funny little little bit where. Lupin is unconscious and his clothes are on fire and Goemon jumps up to catch him to save him from the crashing gyrocopter and just in one little movement slices Lupin's clothes, fiery clothes off and then puts him in his underwear into the, into the car. And it was just, it, I, I laughed. I got a really good chuckle out of that. There was some really good laugh out loud moments for me in this. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and even even the the first scene uh, going back to the first scene between uh, Lupin and uh, and Fujiko, uh, the introduction of and just like Fujiko in the middle of whatever caper she's doing and Lupin's just messing with her with this like uh, medieval knight's armor like gauntlet and just waving it around and just like i kn- i was actually looking for you and then like the wrist of the thing yep. like gives it like a wave you know yeah there was little little fun moments like that uh throughout the film um and then then lupin's recovering from being shot um and we get we get more of the groundskeeper 
and and Ace, I believe the dog's uh, name was. No, the dog's name. He had like a a regular human name. Um. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna kill me. I can't even remember it right now. But uh oh, but while that's also happening, uh, there is a uh moment where uh in uh the inspector uh, inspector Zenigata is talking to the United Nations and you yes. find out that you know back in 79 they also just didn't trust politicians because the politicians all the uh, ever, all the United Nations were protecting Cagliostro yeah they yeah they were all protecting Cagliostro because he kept sending them the counterfeit money because um, he had the counterfeit money from every nation basically um so yeah so he was he was very much had all the politicians in his pocket and, and you know they couldn't do anything and uh the the interesting thing was counterfeiting is not a crime in cagliostro because they own the country so why would they make it a crime yeah of course it makes perfect sense the dog's name is carl uh, by the way carl that's right <laughs> how could i forget carl the dog yeah <laughs> Which, which even the groundskeeper at this point is finally letting on of like, you know, Carl's a good judge of character. How'd you know his name already? And then we finally get the flashback of, you know, Lupin uh, actually had tried to rob the Count before and nearly got killed before 10 years ago. Um, and he was rescued and basically... Uh, you know, kept alive by this little girl who, you know, helped him and brought him food and gave him water and, you know, let him be able to survive. Uh, there was a slightly creepy moment of like, you know, I turned on the charm, but my charm doesn't work on nine-year-olds. And it's like, your charm shouldn't work on nine-year-olds, dude. That's <laughs> really kind of creepy. Uh, well, I didn't. I actually didn't take that moment as as so creepy as as that. I just saw it as like a con man that that tries to charm everyone. Yes. Like like so. Yeah, that, I, I was seen as a yeah. different kind of charm rather than than yep. the the charming of women of the charming of of all is is yeah. Where I went. and and it and it does and it does make sense like later like I that was my initial reaction but then as he plays it later and clearly like doesn't have any interest in her that type of way it, it was like oh, okay no it, it was you know just charming and getting my way kind of thing yeah. so uh and then uh, and then the recovery scene you know food food cures everything yeah which that was i i like the fact that uh and we discussed this before we recorded uh on imdb that was listed as a director trademark of like, oh no, it's a Miyazaki movie, so of course he just stuffed himself with food, and then he's better. Um, and it's like that's not a Miyazaki trade; that's an anime in general trade. Very much so. Dragon, Dragon Ball, and Dragon Ball Z have, has taught me that food cures all. Sensu bean. Yep. Um, except actually in this case, because he ate too much and then felt sick. But he's good to go the next day. Yeah, he's good to go the next day. Uh, and then. And then they kind of they allude to the uh, the plan where you get little bits and pieces of it as before it happens. You know the the arch uh, the archbishop is coming in to marry them. And by the way, the archbishop is a complete dick because yeah. they're stuck in a traffic jam. And he tells his driver, if "You don't get me there on time, you're fired." And I was like, "Damn, archbishop, what are you doing right now?" Yeah, yeah, the archbishop did not come off well. And then of course, you know. Uh, I almost thought, like, I, I thought somebody was going to get disguised as the Archbishop, but I thought they were actually going to bring the, the gardener in uh, because of the similar beard and everything. And it's like, oh, it wasn't the gardener. It was, um, I think it was, it was Gijin, wasn't it? That was... No, no, uh, Jigen, Jigen is, is just hiding. Uh, oh, okay. Lupin, Lupin plays the... Uh, Lupin plays the... The okay. Archbishop. Yeah. Uh, but... Then, then they go to the to the wedding. Uh, you see a news truck coming in, and and the uh, and Fujiko is obviously the the uh, the reporter. You can tell right away, uh, she's not trying to disguise herself much. No, not at all. <laughs> like it was basically she's in a pink uh, one piece 
uh, you know, jumpsuit as opposed to her camouflage one piece jumpsuit. Yeah. Uh, she's got the she's got the April O'Neil uh, uh, disguise going. Yeah, uh, with pink rather than yellow. But um, yeah, and they jump to the wedding uh, where. Uh, you would think the guests would be freaked out by the black hooded cult that was surrounding them and, and running everything, but I guess everybody there was fine. With swords, let alone. Uh, and uh, this is also when I when I had I had two things that that grossed me out during this this wedding thing is one is when I realized that they were related. Yep. <laughs> um, it was and like, I went, oh, oh no. Yeah, it was like the Cagliostro clan reunites again i was like oh no that's not no that's not cool uh, and then they ask her if she's cool with it and they they have her eyes completely dilated because they're, they're alluding to the fact that she's drugged yes uh and she doesn't say anything and then he goes we'll take your silence as consent and i went oh no yeah oh no 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 <laughs> yep um, but yeah, as, as we saw, like, cause Lupin at this point had already put the rings together and kind of figured out the puzzle, um, and saw the inscription that said when light meets dark, you know, such and such happens, um, which was a prophecy that the count had already been and talking about. And it was like, okay, so when light meets, you know, when light and dark come together, or, you know, something's going to happen. And then he, so he has it partially figured out, but not fully figured out until the end. Yep. Or at least he doesn't let us on, in on what he knows, which is always a good move in, in spy and heist stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then this is when the, the, the heist begins. Uh, the uh, Lupin has a doll of himself and a pre recorded message. Uh, that is essentially saying, I know your plan and, and like revealing everything the count has done wrong. So th they cut the feed. Uh, they, they force the, uh, the camera pe people to cut the feed and they, they attack the, the Lupin doll and which causes uh, Clarice to come out of her stupor. Uh, but at this point, the Bishop is already uh, cradling her and, and protecting her. And yep. then you have uh, the, the needed anime action scene of the fights and, and Inspector uh, Zenigata coming in and putting on what I would say the best acting job of the movie, where he pretends yeah, right? like he finds the, he pretends to go the wrong way. It's like, oh, what is this? I found the counterfeit bills. Who would have thought it? Which I just loved. Yep, and 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 because like they they keep implying that you know this is a royal wedding, so it's being broadcast everywhere. So. That's where Fujika comes in, um, and she's you know in perfect April O'Neil fashion, uh, running down with the camera, following Zenigata, uh, and it's like, oh look, we're gonna go stumble upon the bad guys. Oh look, all these printing presses. Yep, and it was it was very nice, uh, nicely done there. And then you jump to uh, Lupin escaping with uh, Clarice. And he, he th this is when he finds the clock tower and starts to begin putting the rest of the of it together. And he goes, oh, we need to go in here uh, and has a great, great little uh, funny bit that got me again of where he says, and I quote, they don't know who they're messing with and tries to pull a gun out of his shirt and gets it stuck <laughs> and, and yep. uh, is attacked and has to run away <laughs> because... Of course, it was a fun, another laugh yeah. out loud moment for me. Yeah, it's like, I like the fact that you have a couple of these like bumbly moments that aren't too crazy, but just more kind of humanize him. Yes. Like he's not going to, yeah, he's not going to be a perfect like, oh, look, I'm going to pull this out and oh, hey, I won the day. It's a, uh, oh, I, I guess I got to do something else. Yep, for sure. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a really cool sequence on this clock in this clock tower with the um, a fighting with the gears uh, and actually going out onto the tower itself. Which a uh, fun fact about this sequence was actually the influence for the Great Mouse Detective clock tower scene at the end of that I movie. I was going to say I was going to say it was like 
the Green Mouse Detective definitely ripped this off, yep, yep. right? It says uh, uh, that the co-directors paid homage to the to this movie with that one. Uh, it was also referenced in a, uh, a Batman animated series uh, OVA called Here is Greenwood, uh, where the students uh, set a play um, of the clock tower, say, uh, saving Clarice on the co- clock tower. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, they... Uh... Yeah, I, I like the fact that at least like uh, Disney animators and and other animators, there's you know cite their references. It's not just oh that would be a cool thing to do. Nobody will know where yep. we got it. Uh, it's like no, we got it from this movie. You should really check it out. Um, and also like the the fact that Great Great Mouse Detective kind of paid paid homage to it is is also interesting because of the fact that. Uh, one of the next projects Miyazaki does uh, is a TV series called Sherlock Hound. I have not heard of this. Yep, there, yeah, it's a TV series that he directed uh, a lot of the episodes of uh, called Sherlock Hound. That's another, you know, they probably saw Sherlock Hound of like, oh, no, we're kind of on the same territory. Oh, it was Miyazaki. Oh, Miyazaki did that. Oh, we could do the clock tower scene with Big Ben. Kind of. That was probably their track, track um, in their mindset. So. And this movie has a weird kind of way that they they end the fighting because technically the villain kind of wins, but his own hubris destroys himself. Which is kind of perfect. Yeah. Though. Like I kind of like that. Um, and you, you also, uh, because it's a kid's movie, uh, somewhat it's PG 13, but like it was, it felt very all ages. Like this is accessible to all kind of thing. Um, because the Lupin series was, you know, popular. It it just felt like, okay, we don't want to have literal blood on our hands of like, we don't want to have Lupin kill this guy. Yeah. But we also are clearly setting up like Lupin could not get the best of him 10 years ago. He's barely getting the best of him. Now this character can't be, be, you know, continuing. We have to kill this character, but how do we kill him? Oh yeah. His own hubris. Like, like he gets smashed between the minute and the hour hand. And it was oddly graphic for how little they showed. Yeah. Right. There was Uh, this crunch noise sound effect that they put in there that I was just like, oh, yikes. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it was this, yeah, this crunch sound effect and then the tower just crumbling um, because he put the the two rings were actually supposed to be inserted into the eyes of this goat or whatever or animal it was on the tower um, above the clock uh, face itself put that in that triggered the whole explosion and it triggered literally opening the floodgates um yep. you know destroying the aqueduct opening the floodgates flooding this lake and revealing this you know town that was like an ancient roman uh city that had been underwater this whole time. Yeah, and then a, a another cool little tidbit about this one. Uh, uh, Gary Truesdale, who co-directed Atlantis, The Lost Empire, admitted that the uh, a scene at the end of Atlantis where the water recedes to, uh, from the sunken city was directly inspired from this scene as well. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, but but it also, the uh, one of the ninjas uh, has a little statement where he pretty much says, he's like, well... That's that's it, and he sees that the flooding, and he goes, you know, Caglio show is done. This this is the the end of the fighting, and yeah, uh, which is a nice little moment. Uh, and it, yeah, it floods the. Uh, uh, it not only reveals the city, but it completely floods the basements where the counterfeiting presses were. Yep. Um, and then and then you have the nice fun end of the movie where. <laughs> where you get to see the pain on Lupin's face when a woman confesses his love for him. Yeah. Because he's straight up like, oh, commitment? No, 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 no. That is not for me. Yeah. Well, and also commitment to a 19-year-old? No. No. <laughs> he, he, like, he like painfully shakes the knee, like, grabs her and goes, I love you like a brother. Yep. Bye. 
Uh, and, also, and also and also and also the disappointment in like you know i've heard about you know the rumors of this treasure of cagliostro for so long and i can't take that anywhere that's a whole city yep like i can't make any money off that well that sucks Although Fujiko gets out with uh, the plates from from the uh, counterfeit. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the fact that... Well, and that's... They even say as they're passing each other on the road of like, Hey, I got my I got my heist done. I'm not complaining. It's like, of course Fujiko is fine. And it's like, yep, I'm good. Uh, uh, so so overall, I would say this is a this is a nice move. Because that's, that's the end. I mean, it ends with... With uh, the inspector chasing them out of town, and yeah, and you know, like I said, status quo restored. They can lead back into regular Lupins. It's a, it's a uh, contained film, as most uh, anime movies are. Yeah, when they're based through series. So, uh, overall, this was a this was a uh, a nice movie. It, I it wasn't as hard of a watch as I thought it was going to be, being as it was based off of a series from you know the seventies, and sometimes these are a little bit rougher to to get through uh the animation quality was was very good especially like i said during those action sequences there was some there were some genuinely sweet and genuinely creepy moments throughout it to kind of keep you intrigued and interested uh so so i think i think a a neat starting off point a neat jumping off point for for miyazaki here where he had this this already polished series and name to take take the handles of and, and then jump into his own thing yeah no that's that's always like you you always see interesting uh directors in tv shows like find their style and then like the first and you know work on on that style and then and you know gradually get better and fine-tune it themselves and then like the first feature they work on it's like oh that's that's their style that's their voice um and i feel like you kind of get that with this film of like you know he's got all the templates and all the stuff of working and you know this is presenting like this is kind of what i want to do moving forward and i'm going to use this you know series to tell my my story my way yeah and then uh it also helped him find some of the people that he wanted to work with in the future too. Yep. Uh, as as an example, the voice for Clarice in the Japanese uh, animation, uh, Sumi uh, Sumi Shimamoto is actually going to be the voice in um, the the next movie that we're going to watch. As oh, well. she's the voice in uh, in Nasaka. Yep. Oh, cool. She was she was brought into Nasaka as well. Cool. She is. She plays Nausicaa. So yeah, yeah. I think it, like we're n- we're we're not gonna go and do. We we discussed this earlier. We're not gonna re re rank everything each each movie, but like, uh, in general, like I think this this might probably be near the bottom, um, but not in the case of like it wasn't as you know quality by any means. But I think it it doesn't have as much of the the personality yet and the personal stories and the connection that you can get in later uh miyazaki films yeah i I would agree with that i mean this one he's essentially using taking someone else's just as you would do with a tv show taking someone else's vision and putting his voice into it a bit but not really being able to use his own voice fully um yes he might have uh written a lot of this movie and been involved in a, in a lot of it but it's not his baby it's not something that he is doing from scratch he has to t- kind of take where it's already been and create something out of that 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 he he can call his and when when it comes to the other Miyazaki that we're going to do like it's it's all him like he is yeah. he, yes there's source material of like mangas um or books or or things of the sort but they are the movie and the animated version of them are going to be his own and he's really able to run with it. So that's, that's kind of where this Lupin is going to kind of have a step behind already 
than uh, from these other movies. Yep, and and it, it's interesting when you say like based on manga uh, and and stuff like that. The really interesting thing about the next film we're going to talk about. Uh, is yes, it is based off a manga, but it's based off a, mon- a manga that is written and drawn by Hayao Miyazaki. Um, yeah, you know, so so it's it's him. It's it's him. Um, like it's it's yeah. So moving forward, we very much get like, you know, the the first the 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 proto studio Ghibli movie because. You know, it's technically not Studio Ghibli, but it's Takata producing. It's you know, uh, Suzuki uh, using the Animage uh, platform to help distribute the manga. Uh, you know, it's it's very much the coming together of the band, and so this it's it's going to be interesting moving forward with with Nasaka next uh, next episode. Oh, very much so. Uh, another another actor, a voice actor that uh, Goro Naya, who who was the Japanese voice actor for Zenigata, is also in in Nausicaa. Oh, cool. So okay. he he took a he found a couple people that he really wanted to continue working with from this. Uh, I mean, even in the in the voice side of it. Um, yep. uh, there's yeah, there's there's a few of them here. Uh, Jodo as well uh, moved on with them, and I think I believe Jodo was the. Uh, was the ninja assistant, creepy assistant guy. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, um, and then, and then also like, uh, just so people know, uh, Miyazaki is not done with the Lupin series by any means. As we said earlier, um, he's going to go on and, uh, come back for the final two episodes of Lupin the third or part two, um, in a couple years that it, he's doing just before, uh, Nausicaa comes out. Yep. So it, he, uh, you know, he was greatly involved in, in early Lupin, um, and he continues to stay involved until really until Ghibli becomes a real, a, a legit real thing. Yep. Um, so yeah, kind of close, close, closing thoughts and then, uh, do your plugs. Uh, I mean a fun kind of jumping off point for for miyazaki films there are I, I mean when we're talking about ghibli as a whole there there are a few things as you said that come before before this but you know they're not quite as easy for us to get a hold of and really the idea is that we're tr- trying to do a little bit more of a focus on miyazaki which is why we're calling it miyazaki and me uh more than the the, the ghibli part but we'll we'll possibly come back to some of those uh it, it's it was fun um it really it, it doesn't give you the full experience of the Miyazaki that that we're going to see I mean next next time we get together but it, it was it was enough of a taste of a, a lot of those tropes and bits and and character characterizations that that Miyazaki really likes to do that that it really just kind of has me kind of excited anticipating watching more and seeing where he grows yeah yeah this like i said it this one like you won't get as as deeply invested as you'll get in other uh, miyazaki and studio ghibli films like this is very much a good you know throw on in the background owned heist movie you know uh and and i i enjoyed it very much for that uh and yeah I'm, i'm just waiting and what looking forward to you know what we see in the future very much so uh so next time we are going to be watching uh nausicaa uh that one is available on hbo max if you are planning to to watch it with us it is still also not technically studio ghibli but it is the first movie that they kind of consider a ghibli movie I mean, really, when it comes down to it, uh, that that is a, that is a Miyazaki Ghibli kind of combination. Yeah, like we said, the, it's it's the one that he um, retained all the rights to, and you know all of that. So so that's why it, it always gets lumped in with Studio Ghibli. Um, but like we said, it's kind of the proto. Like, hey, this is what we can do. Give us enough money. And hopefully this makes enough money 
to fund everything that we are going to do for moving forward. And I have not seen this movie before, so I'm very excited to to really jump into it. Uh, and it looks like it is the beginning of a uh, a theme in Miyazaki and Ghibli movies of a strong female protagonist, yep. uh, which I am very excited for because, as I've said in the uh, on the last episode. I really like movies with strong female protagonists. I, I think that strong female lead characters lead to a very interesting uh, story. And it also is something that is done so much less often than it should be done that it just feels very refreshing when you see it. Yep. And and like we said uh, earlier, it will be the first uh, film that he does with, with uh, Joe His, Hizayashi um, at with doing the the score um who will be a, a very much a mainstay um in the studio ghibli films moving forward so all right so uh for plugs for for shane here um i suppose uh not a lot of new episodes but possibly some coming out of character work um fantasy hangover has been on a little bit of a hiatus uh but we're we're hoping uh, a couple of us uh, carl and i at least are hoping to get back in the in the room and and record some some small bits maybe chris can jump in there a little bit too depending on how busy it is babies tend to be busy yeah. um and uh yeah and then for sure keep checking out miyazaki and me can i plug this show on this show yes uh yeah make sure to like uh, to subscribe a uh, leave a review on itunes and stitcher um that'll help more people see this show uh, subscribe to uh, Knocked Out Entertainment on YouTube because there are YouTube things for us. Yep, yeah, we've got YouTube. Uh, I did the uh, the floating head uh, DVD bouncing uh, thing, uh, which I'll do for this episode. Uh, that has uh, great art from uh, my friend Dave Wheeler from Mindwave Comics. Uh, you know, sketched some stuff for us. So, oh, and thank you, Dave Wheeler, and and. You said Mindwave Comics? Yep, Mindwave Comics. That it looks so cool. It looks awesome. You did great. You did a fantastic job. Thank the you. the joy that came into Shane's eyes when I showed him the sketch at first was amazing. Um and it made me so much happier about it. So I was very excited to see it. I I, I didn't know what to expect when when Kyle said that he was he was uh, asking someone to do that, and once I saw it, I was like, "That is perfect and amazing." Yep, awesome. Yeah, I, I yeah, like I said, I, I contacted Dave because I was like, "I know your style, and I know the style you draw in, and and I know it will be perfect for this." So, uh, but yeah, so so thanks, Dave, for that. Yeah, subscribe on the YouTube. YouTube uh, just search Miyazaki and me. Um, uh, until I can get the custom URL uh, figured out, because I have one, but it's really weirdly spelled, um, so it's not worth <laughs> plugging. Uh, but for everything else, just follow me at Knocked Out Films on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and uh, thanks for listening. And yeah, we'll be back in either a week or two. I'll I'll post in the episode description. Uh, when the next episode will be. And like we said, it'll be Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Be good to each other.